Do you have any ideas of like easy startup, low cost things that people can start? Nope, because the second you allow the word easy to come into your head in building something, it's game over. I see all these kids and they're like, Gary, this is so hard. I'm like, do you understand that you're asking for a 1% life in being an entrepreneur that stands on her or his own feet? It is $630,000 a year in annual income that puts you in the 1% of the richest country in the world. And we've got kids walking around that if they make a million, they think they're a loser. Everything's out of whack, my guy. Do I think there's anything easy about standing on your own two feet and paying for everything and having all that pressure on your chest in perpetuity? No, I do not. Do I think there are many unlimited opportunities? Yes, I do. Attention is the number one asset. You've been transforming lives for a long time, motivating billions of people. Um, I think you give so much to people that today I want to do something a little untraditional and give back to you, all right? So I want you to close your eyes. Feel, feel it in your heart. All right, everybody. Gary can't hear us right now. So <laughs> Gary has been motivating us forever. And Gary has a dream. And we need to motivate him to make sure his dream comes true. So when I make this announcement, we are going to blow the roof off of this place, standing ovation style, all right? The year is 2031, and the New York Jets have a first round pick. And who better to introduce the first round pick, the new owner of the New York Jets, yeah! <laughs> sit, sit, sit. Two, 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 two things on that. One, that was extremely sweet, thank you. Two, it's not gonna be 2031. 2025? No, I'm a marathon runner. I, you know, I think for a lot of the OGs in this room, I think that the world has gotten too fast in some areas and I think people lack patience. I think that a lot of people get caught up that have tremendous skills by wanting it too fast and wanting it to prove to others versus enjoying the process for themselves. That was incredibly beautiful and thank you. But when I think about the goal I set for myself in fourth grade about buying my beloved New York Jets, um, you know, obviously many things have gone well for me professionally, but you know, I still have a lot of work to do to amass the wealth to put myself in that position. And to be frank, that is the part that I'm most enjoying. I actually made a video about a decade ago when I really had a moment with myself where I was like, oh man, I might, I might pull this off. You know, if, if the way this is going, if I do another 20 years of good decision making and putting the right deposits down, I might be able to get into striking distance of this outrageous goal I set for myself. Um, so I made a video. And I made a video that said, I just, I, I literally, it was almost like a video like from the 1980s hostage videos. I, I literally held up a newspaper and be like, today is this date. And I said, I'm making this video because in 30 years if I pull off this great dream, I want everybody who's watching this video to know that today is not my greatest day. Today is potentially my least greatest day as a professional because what my great love affair has been professionally is chasing the efforts and the strategies and the connections and the decisions to get me here, not to get here. I think our society has fallen in love with trophies and I'm in love with the game. Uh -huh. So you're, you're a serial entrepreneur. Let's get down right into the mud, right? Please. To clear the air, right? What I think when people ask you about your feelings of college, yes. I think the questions were asked incorrectly. So we here at Palm Beach State wanted to rephrase the question yes. because I know exactly how you feel about it. I, I worked in the public sector too, yep. and I'm an entrepreneur as well. So I yep. understand, but some people may not understand. So let's rephrase that question. If President Parker hired you as the dean yes. of the entrepreneurship School, yep. STEAM school, right? Yep. So don't forget the A, Yvonne, love you. Um, 
You were the dean of the entrepreneurship yep. program here. How would you set up the program to set up these students that are here in the crowd for the ultimate success? I got a lot of love for you for being able to decode you know, what I've been saying. As we all know, especially in a social media world, which I'm very passionate about and think we demonize it too much without realizing how much wonderful things come along with it, um, many things are taken out of context. And I appreciate you because your point is well taken. To me, and we were saying this backstage when we were prepping for this, we were kind of just shooting the breeze and talking about this very subject. To me, education is the single most important thing in the world, period. The packaging and selling of education I think needs to be thought about because it always ebbs and flows. The world changes. Uh, This morning I gave a speech at a very significant marketing conference that had all the Fortune 500 CMOs down in Miami. And what I said to the room was, this industry of ours, the Fortune 500 Madison Avenue agency world, we're we're romantic about yesterday, the Mad Men era, and we're infatuated with tomorrow, the metaverse and AI, and we stink at today. (laughs) And I feel very similar about education. You know, if I was the dean and had that kind of blessing, I would reverse engineer the practicality of the reality of the world. I would focus on the things that are clearly, you know how bright this room is? There's very few people here who couldn't right now list five to seven clear opportunities of the next decade that would really benefit our children in learning. I literally hire kids out of college. I have a 2,000 person global agency and I look at the curriculum that colleges are teaching for marketing at the highest levels. And there's literally kids as we sit here right now being taught how to write a press release in marketing class. Do you know how insane that is? So, you know, if I would create a curriculum that would focus on things like prompt engineering because that is gonna be the skill set that will make people know how to use AI properly for an outcome. I would, if it was entrepreneurship, we'd maybe never be in the classroom because nothing is happening in there in entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is like working out. You can't read about (laughs) push-ups. You have to do them. And to be an entrepreneur, you have to do. And I see all sorts of kids, but you know, I'm 48. So I came up when entrepreneurship wasn't even a thing. When I was in my 20s, forget about a child. In my 20s, I'm like, I wanna be a businessman. That was the word for entrepreneurship. If I even heard entrepreneurship, and again, some of the lovely faces out there that are over 45, you remember this. If entrepreneurship was thrown around 25 years ago, that was code for loser. (laughs) <laughs> right? And then it flipped heavy in the last 15 years to the point where like when I see that sizzle reel, I'm like, that's the stuff I grew up with that would look for like an athlete or a rapper. Like, it's cool now, which is amazing because it's my great passion. It is my great joy. But I also believe that it confused a lot of people. There's a lot of people who now want to be entrepreneurs. I want to be the quarterback of the New York Jets. It's not happening. <laughs> and, I think, and I think my concern is that a lot of people go into entrepreneurship thinking it's a thing. It is a skill set. And if I was to teach entrepreneurship in this incredible institution, we may never be in the classroom. We'd have to go do entrepreneurial things. Yeah. And including first and foremost, just like you have that swag, if you can't sell, you might as well get some other gig. Yeah. And so there's a lot to it but you don't learn about selling by reading one of my books. You have to go out and sell. One of the great things that I believe, I couldn't, you know, I'm sure a lot of people here have children, grandchildren, or even people in, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s who are looking to mix it up. One of the great opportunities for everyone if they truly care about entrepreneurship is to work retail. Interacting with human beings and understanding how they roll is the only way you're gonna figure this out. And I think retail, restaurant, hospitality, true interaction at scale with humans of all different shapes and sizes and income levels and interests and having that ability to reverse engineer and counterpunch every situation, that's a skill set that you have to refine. I learned that 
on Tingley Lane in Edison, New Jersey selling lemonade. I learned that at the Phillipsburg Mall in New Jersey selling baseball cards. I learned that at my daddy's liquor store in Springfield, New Jersey. Like those, those Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours, by the time I was 22, I was in the game. So are you saying that that is where you learn grit? And can you give some examples of how some of these students can pick up grit? Or is that something that comes with you? Grit, grit is teachable. Really? Yeah, because it's circumstantial. You can't have grit if mommy and daddy give you money. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what, but you know what makes me laugh inside about that moment? The people that just laughed and clapped are mommy and daddy. <laughs> and mommy and daddy come up to me on DM, in my messages, on email, at the airport all the time and say, Gary, I need your help because they know how much, you know, I'm in a very fortunate spot in my career where 15 to 25 is a demo that I have juice with and we relationship and there's an authenticity there and they say, Gary, I'm struggling, I need grit for my kid, did this, that, and I'm like, stop giving them money. (laughs) The people that just laughed and clapped are still putting them on the payroll. You don't, like, this is the jungle. And right now, parenting and modern parenting is creating zoo animals. We overcoddle. We've eliminated merit. Our society, well-intended, decided to invent crazy stuff like eighth place trophies. (laughs) And so we've lost our way out of good intent. This is called a prosperous empire. I was a very poor student, but there was one class I was good at, history, and I never understood why until I got into my early 40s. I'm obsessed with pattern recognition. I know things don't change. I know humans definitely don't change. Circumstances changes, platforms changes, mediums change. We are the Roman Empire. When you started this and you said, can you believe this, the America? Listen, America's got its things, what does it? But I promise you, nobody's leaving. So this is a remarkable place, but we must also acknowledge we've had a level of prosperity for so long that we're soft. People are complaining about going to an office five days a week as if we're like hanging them from trees. (laughs) It's insanity. By the way, by the way, I want everybody to hear this. I'm not proposing that we need to be in the office five days a week. I believe in technology, I believe in Zoom, I believe in efficiency. That's not what I'm proposing. I'm asking this room, are we paying attention to what people complain about? As we sit here right now, there are 850 million people around this world, over 10% of our society, that does not have access to clean water. I said to the board of Charity Water, there are 850 million people, as we sit here right now, that cannot get to clean water within 12 hours. And we're complaining that we got the wrong milk at the Starbucks? We've gotten so soft. And so how do you get to grit? You either live it, it's similar to, but it can be taught. I have watched trust fund kids get caught up financially and over a two to three year period, first go through a year of detox. (laughs) If you're paying for your kid's Uber or Equinox membership or their apartment, or like you take that away, that's detox. That's a drug. But after that year, things start to change. And right now, too many parents and kids have double resentment relationships. Because let me tell you a dirty secret, parents that are putting kids on payroll. I'm getting the DMs also from the 25-year-olds, and here's the insight that is not being talked about in public. A 25-year-old that has their parents paying for their lifestyle is subconsciously and now starting to consciously understand that their parent doesn't think they're capable of. You think you're helping, but you're creating levels of insecurity. And so these are complicated matters. I don't sit up here on a pedestal, I have two children, I get it. When you love something more than breathing and yourself, of course you're gonna do. But there's a reason that we talk about grit. It's because it's going away. Because it's really frothy out there. People, and people have lost so many things. Uh, Again, over 45 year olds. Remember the concept of saving money? (laughs) People don't even talk about that anymore. People are more interested in buying things to flex, to put Band-Aids on their insecurities. And so they're buying BMWs and Louis Vuitton. Dumb shit. (laughs) 
I want to say I was guilty of that. I have a brother who's 17 years younger than me, and I was just throwing money at his problems and not help, helping him figure out his own way. So, Kristen, wherever you are at, I'm sorry. I'm not going to stop going. There he is right and, there. And, 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 and by the way, and I love both of you, like this, it, it's so well intended. That's the part that's confusing. It's incredibly well. Do you know how remarkable that is? That you worked and built and you wanted to give love to, like, I have an 11 year younger brother. I know what half father, half brother looks like. Right, that's what that is when you got that kind of, it's beautiful. It doesn't mean that it's not a vulnerability. So let's, let, let's help these guys build uh, something here. I spent $300 to come to this event. I'm a college student. I'm here to see Gary Vee. I leave here highly motivated and then I come down to earth and I'm like, how am I supposed to make my first hundred thousand dollars from here? Do you have any ideas of like uh, easy startup, low cost things that people can start? Nope. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Because the second you allow the word easy to come into your head in building something, it's game over. Right? I see all these kids and they're like, Gary, this is so hard. I'm like, do you understand that you're asking for a 1% life in being an entrepreneur that stands on her or his own feet? It is $630,000 or so right now of earnings in America, the richest country in the world, $630,000 a year in annual income that puts you in the 1% of the richest country in the world. And we've got kids walking around that if they make a million, they think they're a loser. Everything's out of whack, my guy. Do I think there's anything easy about standing on your own two feet and paying for everything and having all that pressure on your chest in perpetuity? No, I do not. Do I think there are many unlimited opportunities? Yes, I do. Do I think they require a level of patience? Notice how I jumped in with the Jets thing. Yeah. The second you want something fast is the second I'll show you something that's vulnerable. A relationship, a business, a platform. Speed is the enemy to so many right now. People hear me pitching patience on my social constantly and they get all mad because they interpret it as uh, complacency. Yeah. There's a reason there's two different words in the English language. One is patience and one is complacency. They are not the same. I am, oh I took this hat, I put this hat on to give some love, but oh, backstage, wow. there we go, backstage, I had a hat. <laughs> backstage I had a hat that I was wearing today and it says ambitious. I'm 48 years old, I've accomplished a lot of things professionally and personally. I'm hungry as hell right now. The fire I have in my stomach, it's crazy. It comes from coming from the dirt. For those that you don't know, I was born in the USSR. I was literally born in the most opposite place of my DNA. I'm a purebred entrepreneur. I had no tolerance for school in the 80s when it was requirement. I was an immigrant. Every Russian immigrant that came over from the Soviet Union and all my Indian immigrant friends and Asian immigrant friends and Caribbean, it was all education, all the time. And I was getting D's and F's. Do you know how hard it is to get D's and F's in school? <laughs> I've come to learn it's really hard. Like even people that do nothing get C's, I got D's and F's. But that was because I was 100% pot committed to who I was. When I was in class as a 10 year old, I couldn't listen to Saturn and Neptune because that wasn't me. There was no, I had self-awareness as a child, luck of the draw DNA, remarkable parenting. I just was there and that is my answer to the question you just had. How do I think the people in this room leave here and get their first 100,000? The only answer is self-awareness. Let me explain what I mean by that. Too many people want to be like. Too many people just saw that Skittles painting and see this man swag and they want to be him. I get it, I want to be him, he's cool as shit. <laughs> <clears throat> but if you were not born with that talent and you were not putting in that 10,000 hours to put in that talent, it's unlikely that you are gonna be a remarkably successful commercial artist within 12 months. It doesn't work that way. This is why I love sports so much. Sports, you can't hide. You can hide in education. You can hide in government. You can hide in corporations. There are two places that are very hard to hide. Sports is impossible, because we watch the game and there's an outcome. And the next closest thing is business and entrepreneurship. You can fake it a little bit, you can sell your company underwater and say you exited, but really you didn't, you know? <laughs> you can play, but 
merit matters. And the way that so many people here, my friend, will get there is that they know who they are. The number seven at Facebook made a lot more money than the number one of most businesses ever created. And that number seven had the self-awareness to say they're not a number one. Sometimes you have entrepreneurial tendencies. You're not a purebred entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is lonely. Yeah. Entrepreneurship is hard. And that was actually what I was leading to next is, you know, self-awareness is important. So, you know, starting a company is daunting. You know, your friends are gonna be like, what? That, that little tool that you invented, that thing is silly. Or even your family's gonna fight you down. How do you stay motivated in the journey when people don't believe in your vision? Pretty damn easy. If you're an athlete on the field, how the hell are you listening to people in the stands eating popcorn booing you? I, 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 have, I have no tolerance for friends and family members who have opinions from the sidelines. I appreciate it, often it's well intended, but they're not playing. What does their opinion of my ability to make a little tool for hair or an agency or sell, it's irrelevant. You know, uh, I'm gonna point out a superstar here who's an alumni of Palm Beach State, and we had dinner the other day, and that's exactly what he said, and it really resonated with me. Alexio, stand up. My our Shark Tank brother. It's, brother, it's, it's completely irrational. Why on earth would you factor in people's hot takes on your journey. You should listen. You never want to be delusional, right? But the concept of how you deal, you have no choice. The number one reason so many people struggle with happiness in life is they put someone else's opinion over their own feelings. It's very real, bro. It's like, and, and this goes way deeper than entrepreneurship. Like, listen, I'm, I'm the byproduct of parents that are very polar opposites and I got to see it up close and personal and I was fortunate enough to know my dad's mom who was incredibly cynical and negative and very honestly, when I tell this group, most people do not understand what the USSR was from 1917 to 1991. It was not like China or Iran is now. It was like North Korea. You were not allowed to even leave the country. It was jail. People died in their 50s. You know why Russians drink vodka? They wanted to die. It was an incredibly negative place. And so I have no judgment on my family tree. It was very hard. But I also had a mother who lost her mother at five. Her father went to jail when she was 10 for 10 years on some dumb shit, what they did in the Soviet Union. And she is the most optimistic, happy person on earth and instilled that in me. In life and in entrepreneurship and in corporate and in nonprofit and in education, in the world, you find what you're looking for. If you decide to sit here today and be cynical and pessimistic about the world and everything that's going on, I have good news, you can find it. (laughs) However, here's the part that I don't think people believe. If you are optimistic and hopeful and seek joy, you can find unlimited. People have a very, very, very poor understanding of the world and history. People tell me all the time, obviously we all know what's going on, there's so much going on, right? I'm in many dinner tables like all of you are and they're like, it's never been worse. I'm like, you sure about that? <laughs> and so we, we are incredibly delusional about that and, and so I choose optimism because I believe it. If we were sitting in this room the week after the atomic bomb was invented, in the late 40s, early 50s and sitting around and then you told me seven, 10 other countries would have it pretty quickly, I would have never sat there and thought 80 years later it would have never been used. That would have seemed completely illogical. I believe it's an indication of the human spirit. Of course we have conflict, of course there's things. And the world is very good about trying to make us not like each other, my man. As if we didn't get into a place in the world, as if it wasn't enough that we struggle with each other around race and gender and religion, now they're trying to pump negativity between generations. They're trying to teach Gen Z to hate the boomers. I love when they're like, you guys fucked up the world. I'm like, I'm like do you know anything about the boomers' grandparents? Well, let's, let's do I want to stay on this, well, right, if I may. Well, 
if I just, if I may, because this is very important, please my friends, from the oldest to the youngest in this room, please don't let them teach you to hate each other. Please. There's no reason, no reason. And so, yeah, I mean, back to entrepreneurship to bring it down a level, if you lack optimism, you have no shot. And op- entrepreneurship is half delusional, <laughs> half optimism, and someone who, you know, entrepreneurship is losing constantly with an occasional win. And I think the biggest reason that we will struggle with entrepreneurship in the next generation is back to grit. We have demonized losing. The reason I stick on eighth place trophies is we are teaching kids that losing is bad. You show me a six year old that loses this weekend in a baseball game and starts crying and I'll show you a winner. And every parent that goes up to that kid and says it doesn't matter, it's just a game, should be punched in the face. (laughs) (laughs) Figuratively, figuratively. With yes. Technology coming. Uh, I have a mom and pop store, maybe a bookstore now, or we're selling, you know, traveling goods, um, and you know, online things are going on right now. How do those people get ready for a new shopping experience in store, or how do they prepare themselves for the future? It is so much more fun to put yourself out of business before someone else does it for you. <laughs> That's how. I was on stages like this as a youngster, begging and pleading bookstores to pay attention to having a website and to taking on social media and to doing Google AdWords, and they dismissed Amazon. They put yesterday on a pedestal. They said, Gary, you don't get it. This is 1997, Gary, at the Chamber of Commerce event in New Jersey. They're like, Gary, you don't get it. People like to go into the store and touch and feel it. I said, friends, you don't get it. People like better prices and convenience. And so, what do I say to that person, my man? I say that unless you go on the offense, someone else is going to. I get how you grew up. I get how you wish the world was. The problem is that's not how the market responds. Like, I think that this is a very basic question that has played out a hundred times. I spoke in Florida years ago. I was an early investor in Uber. I missed the early, early the great mistake of my, literally I was investing a lot at the time and Travis, one of the co-founders of Uber was one of my best friends. My first book I ever wrote, the only person I acknowledge in the whole book besides my family is Travis because he had down period before Uber and he like helped me with the book. My homie. And I passed twice on the angel round of Uber. If I wrote the twenty-five to $50,000 check that I normally was writing back then, I would have made $500 million. That's called a mistake. (laughs) So back in the day. But to finish that thought, I apologize. I spoke in 2000, I don't want to make it up, maybe 11, 12. I spoke at the black car and taxi convention. This was about a year and a couple months into Uber's run. It was in San Francisco, New York. It was still not everywhere. And I gave a lot of talk of like, this thing's coming, and when I tell you a room like this, laughed me off the stage. And they laughed me off the stage because of naivete. When I went into Q&A, one of the guys, maybe the third guy said, Gary, that was very compelling, but you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, educate me, sir. He goes, we've got the politicians in our pocket. I said, sir, how? He said, how what? I said, how do you have the politicians in the pocket? He goes, we have money. I'm like, you clearly have no fucking idea what Silicon Valley is. (laughs) They have a lot more money than you. And that's where I get emotional. I get emotional because people hold on to moats that don't exist. If you are not consumer centric, you will lose. Uber didn't win because they had more money. Uber won because it was better for the consumer. The consumer is the only thing. For me, I obsess over the consumer for the travel, for the bookstore, if you make it great for the consumer, then you can win, but you can't be delusional. If you sell a book for 30 bucks that Amazon sells for 13, you're gonna find the occasional person that wants that high touch and what have you, but there's no scale in that, and you're gonna lose a lot of people. And business, 
Business is a tough game, man. Yeah. Business is not your mommy and daddy. Business is not the government. It's not the education system. Business is an unemotional merit framework. And it is what it is. And so one of the reasons I spend a lot of time thinking about parenting and what I talk about with eighth place trophies is we are grooming zoo animals. We're caging them and protecting them. I don't know if you know what happened back in the day with zoos. They would run animals and then they would put them back in the wild. Those animals died within the first day. Because if you're a zebra chilling in the Bronx Zoo, (laughs) and then they put you out there in Africa, a lion is eating your ass within a day. So, so man, with, with technology going where it's at, you know, back in the day, we're gonna age ourselves. We were working on DOS. Like even when I was growing up, I had to learn Illustrator and stuff like that, you know. And I just want to know where are we going with this AI thing? Oh, it's we're scary. going. We don't even know if the Drake diss track was real that came out, you know. So we're, we're go- going with AI. To your point on that, uh, I'll get to AI in a second, but let me talk to you about. AI's implications day to day. Deep fake videos. If, you know, I see a lot of reactions people know, but for the people in here that don't know that term, that'd be fine. You should really Google it. It's very fascinating. I would argue over the last hundred years of our society that video has been the judge and jury of our society. Video proof has been very important to the last hundred years. Every person in this room within a decade will not believe a single video they see on the internet. We're going completely the other way. You're also, if you play the chess moves out, this is also why the blockchain is about to become very important. Right now there's plenty of talk about crypto and that's a whole different thing, but the blockchain. Decentralized servers that nobody owns is going to become a very important part of our society because people will be able to go there first, prove, because you can't manipulate it, and then to internet. It's gonna be fascinating. And I remind people all the time, everything that we live on today didn't exist 120 years ago. Like, you know, planes and phones and TVs and like, people don't understand like how technology works. So where are we going with this? In a place that's gonna make every single person's head spin. AI is one of the most powerful technologies in the history of mankind. It will absolutely affect every single thing. And people talk first about jobs, right? We think about that a lot. But I remind everybody that when the tractor was invented, one of the biggest conversations was jobs. Most of the people in the world worked on farms when the tractor was invented. And the tractor put a lot of people out of business. Do you know how many employees New York City had cleaning up horse poop before the car was invented? Plenty of jobs. AI will take jobs out it will also create new jobs. Back to me running the entrepreneurial practice here, prompt engineering. There will be many people, many people in 10 years who have a job called prompt engineering, and it's a wonderful job. It's critical thinking, it's very creative, and it will be profoundly important. And so, where do I think it's going? To a very, very significant place. The question becomes timing. I don't think anyone's confused. We are in a very interesting geopolitical time right now. We've lived in a globalization world for the last 40 years. It doesn't feel like we'll be living in that forever. The lines in the sand are starting to get drawn. And what I think you're gonna start seeing is governments getting a little bit more into the private sector. In the US, plenty of people have lots of feelings of like, yeah, let's ban TikTok until they don't know their history and understand how this stuff works. You start there as an external thing and then you start looking at Google and Meta and other things as internal. So we're in very interesting times, my friend, where I hope people are very thoughtful and don't just have very quick, hot takes on things based on their convenience or their subjective opinion of the moment without being educated. And so where do I think it's taking us? To a whole new world order, similar to what the internet has been able to accomplish over the last 40 years, 30 years. I think we can all agree, especially the people that are my age and above in this room, the internet came along and it changed things. But back to AI taking jobs, Again, back to my 1995, six, seven, eight Chamber of Commerce events. I I talked a lot about search engines back then. And I said, you know this Google thing, and I'll never forget it. I was on it, one of my first panels was with a gentleman who was the regional head of sales for the Yellow Pages. (laughs) And I said to him, and I said, I said, I'm 
incredibly concerned for this gentleman, I think that the yellow pages are very vulnerable to Yahoo. And once again, as pretty much my whole career, he was quite cynical to that. My contemporaries in the room were cynical to that. The problem is technology is undefeated. And it's always gonna come for you eventually. And so I, I ask people to be prepared for it. I think of AI and technology as a tidal wave. You have two choices. Do what most people do, which is dig a little hole in the stand and put your head in it. This is not a strategy. Or grab a surfboard and ride it. And that requires you getting educated, you putting in the work. I wish nothing changed. I spend my time trying to figure things out. And then I do them. I'm not excited things change. That's more work. I get it. But we have no choice. Yeah. It, technology and, and the world doesn't care about your feelings. Let's, uh, let's round this out with, with some talk on marketing. So digital marketing, personal branding, and the world of social media and that landscape, um, you know, if, with me, with my brand, it took so long for me to realize that I should keep myself as the inventor with the story, with my brand, because that what was bringing people in. I wanted to separate my face from the brand. And it's an, now, and, it's an and game. Yeah. Too many people are obsessed with or. Mm. Got it? Uh, this is a big framework for me. The world is obsessed with or. It's and. So yes, of course, just like me, I as a public figure in this digital age am able to bring a lot of awareness to my businesses and the things I do, but my businesses also do their own marketing. Right? Winetext.com. You should all sign up. My dad would be pumped. <laughs> Winetext.com, we market for because we think it's the best way to buy wine in the world. But I also use my personal brand to bring awareness to it. They both coexist. But the reason you thought that is people in business and in marketing have been infatuated with or because you couldn't afford to do everything back in the day. The newspaper was expensive. The radio was expensive. Direct mail was expensive. Television ads were expensive. But now it's so low cost. To just give a very tactical nugget, every person here, regardless of what you're passionate about and you want awareness for, being elected as an official, selling something, raising money for a nonprofit, all of you, the number one most important skill in making something happen in the world today is being good at organic social media, period. And people don't see it. The talk I gave this morning at nine o'clock, they still think commercials are more important. As if any of you watch those. I mean, it's crazy. And so the reason you thought that was we've been taught or. The new world order is and. So, um, actually, thank you so much because the first audio book I listened to because your boy don't read too well was Jab, Jab, Jab. So thank you for that. Thank you, my guy. Help me for my entrepreneurship journey. Um, you have 12 and a half, that's, uh, uh, there's copies available for sale out there and then I believe uh, you'll be signing a billion copies backstage. I did it. Show. You did it already? I did it. Wow, but talk to us about day trading attention, this new project. My new book coming out in a month called Day Trading Attention is the follow up to Jab, 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 Right Hook. You were gonna name it. Jab, 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 Left Hook. <laughs> uh, but, but I realized that day trading attention really captures what I want for all of you. We are now in a world that is and so everyone here who understands how to do organic social media, how do you, what video and picture or written word works better on Facebook versus Instagram versus Snap versus YouTube versus LinkedIn, that framework is for all the OGs in this room, that is what television, radio, and the print and direct mail were. It is the new world order. It is where the attention of society is. And I think all of you in here know, it's not just a kid thing, right? There's unlimited, I mean, I sell to a lot of 60 to nine year olds in many of the demos and things I work on. We crush on Facebook, crush. And don't forget, that started as college kids. And so, it, it's, not that, it's not that other mediums are dead. To me, the thesis of day trading attention is why would you wanna pay more money to make something happen that you could do for less? That sounds incredibly irrational and not logical. And so I'm trying to help the world. I went very detailed. I, I, I also am not a great reader. I just read my audio book in LA for a week. It was a grind. 
<laughs> and it was funny, I've read all my books for my audio book, except Jab, 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 Right Hook because it was so visual. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, it was interesting, it was the first book that I've ever written that in the studio booth reading, there was a level of me being a little bored. And you would think that's bad, who wants to write a boring book, but it wasn't that. It was that I went so technically deep in it because I felt like the time was right. I know as I sit here with everyone here today and I have great hopes and when I speak, my only dream is that someone can leave with something that brings them value. I, I don't know what else someone would do up here. Yeah. You know, and so my, similar to this book, I, I am 100% positive that whoever is best at organic social media across the 10 platform, uh, how many people here are in a B2B business? Raise your hands. So those hands, those 20 hands, you can't imagine what LinkedIn is right now. It's everything. I would never do another trade show. You could fire your whole sales staff if you were great at LinkedIn marketing. It's absurd how big that platform is. It's huge. And it's not DMing and spamming people, it's content the way you put out on Facebook and things of that nature. So I'm aware that people, you know, I'm looking around and I'm aware that some people are like, okay, like, really, like, it's so real, it's uncomfortably real. So I tried to write the Bible for it because I think it's, it's the now and I think the faster people understand what it means, the quicker people will get there. And I'll tell you what happened. If, you, if, if I may get a little nerdy with you, social media for the first 12, 13 years, the last kind of, you know, call it, 2006 to 2020, those 14 years, social media worked like email marketing. You tried to amass as many followers as you could, and then when you would post, a percentage of those people would see it. That's how it worked. I was an early investor in Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, like, I've been in it. Liquid death, too? Liquid death. That was an employer of yours, wasn't it? It sure was. Man, I need to come work here, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Now social media is different. The TikTokification of every platform is now here. The way social media works now, if you're sitting here and you're borderline inspired to be like, you know what, I'm gonna take Gary on his bluff. I may go back for my organization or the things I'm passionate about and start to post a little more on social. I'm not gonna demonize it for what I politically am worried about. I'm gonna look at it for what it is, which is an empty vessel that humans fill. What you'll learn is that if the quality of the content is good, it will find its audience. There are people in this room I have 15 million followers on TikTok that I've worked very hard since it was Musical.ly before it was TikTok amassing. Yet, tonight, I could post something that only gets 60,000 views and you, sitting here today, inspired by these words, may create an account and post your first post and if it's good, it may get two million views. That is a level of meritocracy around the message that is profound and the biggest opportunity in the history of marketing in my opinion. I just have to get my game together on social media. I, I, my social media guy is right there capturing it, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to catch up, buddy. It's so, good. positivity, stories, family, collections. I've been here for two days, and I will tell you that my wife and I, she's right up there in the front, my wife and I are almost thinking about moving here because the love that I felt here at Majority of the students here are in grants and scholarships. No debt. Love. Look at that. I know you love that. And most of them go back to their own community to, to build Palm Beach. We got um, Jeremiah, right? Uh, is she still here? No. She got a she got a scholarship today. She saved the child that drowned. I mean, these guys are really here for the community. I love it. And I felt it here. So I wanted to to talk about V-Friends. V-Friends is my Pokemon meets Sesame Street intellectual property that I started three years ago. I have a kid's book coming out called Meet Me in the Middle uh, in uh, July that I'm excited about. I am gonna try to build the next Disney Pokemon Hello Kitty. Uh, I have a, uh, for all the parents in here that know what Coco Melon is, I signed a deal with Moonbug, the makers of that, so my V-Friends cartoons are coming to YouTube Kids this summer. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur, you know, and I like starting businesses, but the reason I started it is the message that I'm putting out to the world on the mindset and perspective and humanity, I felt, I felt like I know where Gary Vee works. I'm able to get people at 15, 16, 17, 18, 
and start that journey and start to maybe change the conversation a little bit. But I feel like a lot of stuff is obviously created at a very young age. And so when I created this world, when I think about my character, accountable ant. I'm very passionate about accountable ant. I wanna make every kid on earth love accountable ant because I think accountability leads to happiness. I think the single biggest issue in the world right now is we've gotten very good at pointing fingers and telling everybody else what they're bad at. We're great at pointing fingers and we're terrible at pointing thumbs. And so, to me, there is no character in Disney or Marvel or, or Star Wars or Coco Bell. I, I don't see accountability, right? I call the book Meet Me in the Middle because I will, you, if you got a sense of how I've been talking here, I think a lot about the world in our political framework. I don't think anyone's gonna be confused when I tell you America's gotten very red and very blue. And I think everyone here who's lived a little bit knows the answer is purple. And I think we've really, thank you. And I, and I, I, I think we've lost purple and that's what Friends' goal is, is to get the world to be purple. Palm Beach State, although it's, it's the green and gold color, it's, it's purple. I believe it. <laughs> One last thing. There was a $8 million donation by... Stephen Ross. Exactly. What does he own? The Miami Dolphins. <laughs> so when, when we get that if I may, if I may, I hate the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> Yes. Whenever it's down the road, I'll be looking for you for that eight million dollars scholarships. Two things on that. One, <laughs> let's make it sixteen. <laughs> two, two. I don't know if you know this, but the only business partner I've ever had in my life outside my brother and my dad is Stephen Ross. Stephen Ross owns a piece of VaynerMedia. Oh wow. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The Jets were actually one of my first clients and they became the most followed team on Facebook and Twitter back in 2010 because I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Steven Ross is Steven Ross. He was like, wait a minute, why are the Jets the most followed team? <laughs> and he hired Matt Higgins, who was the president of the Jets, when Matt came over to be the CEO of the Dolphins. Matt knew who his secret weapon was, so they invested in VaynerMedia. And so Steve and I have been business partners for a long time. Steve and I live in the same building in New York. And I let Steve know every time I see him that I hate the Miami Dolphins. Well, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let him bring up the invoice for that $16 yeah. million. Dollars. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you for having me. Thank Unbelievable. you. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. Hey everybody, I wanted to say that a new book is coming. The follow-up to Jab, 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 Right Hook, originally called Jab, 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 Left Hook, but I finally captured what I've been doing for the last 20 years as an entrepreneur, as a creator and influencer, as an operator of a marketing company that works with Fortune 5,000, 500 companies, and really the punchline of what I'm seeing in society, which is day trading attention, how to actually build brand and sales in the new social media world. I'm really proud of this book. When I read it, and some of you follow my social enough to see the clips, when I read it in studio, it got so deep, it goes so detailed. It goes macro and micro as I like to roll. And so if you've not picked up a copy yet, go to GaryVee.com slash DTA, which stands for Day Trading Attention. I have a feeling that this book, much like Jab, 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 Right Hook, literally got an email if they just read it. It's 10 years ago. The updated version of the marketing manual for your marketing team. Definitely if you have a social media person that runs your stuff, you need to get a book for them. And definitely the marketers in Fortune 500 for your staff and the entrepreneurs and creators and influencers who are trying to build something for themselves. So proud of it. Hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed putting it together. The manual that we are gonna give to everybody when they join VaynerMedia to read and hopefully the manual to the modern marketing world and especially the social media first world. A day trading attention out this May 2024. Pre-order your copy now.